So we'll talk about Fourier type, which is all about boundedness of the Fourier transform from LP to LP prime. Let's recall the definition of the Fourier transform on various different groups. Fourier transform on the real line, on the torus and on the integers. We haven't actually defined it on the integers. So recall it from your past Fourier analysis course if you've done that. X is a Barnack space. Oh, it's a complex Barnack space, I should say. I haven't written that in my notes, but whenever I do Fourier stuff with a Barnack space, it has to be a complex Barnack space. There are complex exponentials everywhere. You can do this for real Barnack spaces, but then you have to talk about sine and cosine series or whatever, and it gets a little bit notationally awkward. So if I've got a function f, it's integrable on the real line, valued in x, strongly integrable, of course. Then I have a Fourier transform, which I'll call F sub R to distinguish from all of the other Fourier transforms. And this will be a, an L infinity function, also valued in X on R. And you know the definition of this, but I'm going to write it out anyway. Minus two pi I T Xi F of T DT. That's a Fourier transform on the real line. You can do higher dimensional versions, but I won't. Now, if you have a function on the torus, which is integrable, so let's take a, a g, which is L1 on the torus. Remembering the torus is just the unit interval, but we call it a torus because you identify the edges, it's a circle, whatever. The Fourier transform of that, we call it F sub t. This is an L infinity sequence on the integers. So now instead of, it's not a function on the torus, it's a function on the integers. And its definition for an integer n is given as the integral over the torus. Remembering this is just the integral over 0, 1. Of e to the minus 2 pi i tn g of t dt. So it's the same definition as the one on the real line, but the integral over the real line is replaced with an integral over the torus. And the frequencies are restricted to integers because that's the only thing that will make sense. And finally, if we have a function, which is, well, it's a sequence on the integers, we call it H, then the Fourier transform of that is, you should be able to guess, an L infinity function on the torus, right? So now starting with the integers, you go to the torus. And the definition is the same as the above. Now the frequency T is in the torus. And you have to think of the integral over the integers as an integral with respect to the counting measure. So we have a sum over the integers, e to the minus two pi i nt h of n. It's the same definition every time, but you just have to be a bit careful about where everything lives. You're always integrating against a complex exponential with the appropriate frequency. Except in this case here, well, you're summing over n and t is the, the frequency variable here. So the roles are, are switched, but everything is really the same thing. And most of you have probably seen this before, nothing really new. But of course you can do everything x valued. Uh, if, yeah, I won't say anything about other groups yet, but you can do this on other groups, of course. Once you've got a notion of a Fourier transform, you have a notion of an x valued Fourier transform, but that's not too important to us. So let's make a definition. The Barnack space X has real Fourier type or R Fourier type P, where P is between one and two. If for all F in L1, which also happens to be in LP, you have an estimate of this form of the Fourier transform from LP to LP prime. I make this assumption, F has to be in L1 so that the Fourier transform is defined and F has to be in LP so that this right-hand side is actually finite. So the Fourier transform maps LP to LP prime, initially just L1 functions, but then by density on all LP functions, 
you've got this boundedness, you can extend the operator by density. So that's real Fourier type P. I'm going to define three properties. I should have written it in red. Torus Fourier type P. It's the same definition three times. You can guess what this is going to be. For all G in L1 of the torus, intersect LP of the torus. In this case, LP is actually contained in L1. So this is actually just LP, but let's write it as L1 intersect LP. You have the same estimate with the Fourier transform on the torus. It maps LP to LP prime. Oops. Now the Fourier transform is, this is a sequence. So let's write this little LP on Z controlled by G on LP of the torus. So the same estimate that we asked for for real Fourier type, but now we're using the torus Fourier transform, noting that it maps functions on the torus of functions on the integers, functions to sequences. And of course, we're going to define Z Fourier type, P between one and two, if, and you know what this definition will be now. So for all L1 sequences that are also LP sequences, the Fourier transform of H, now this is a function on the torus. The LP norm of that's controlled by, the LP prime norm, sorry, is controlled by the LP norm of the original function on the integers. Did I make any mistakes in that definition? I hope not. They should, they're all the same thing, basically. And of course, for a general locally compact abelian group where you can define a Fourier transform, you have a notion of G Fourier type with respect to that G. Now, I mentioned all of this stuff at the end of last Thursday's lecture, but just very, very briefly, here's, this is a somewhat better definition. Just I've been a bit more careful this time. So now you're used to properties of Barnack spaces that depend on parameters, you know, types and co-types and whatever. And you're, you're probably asking yourself the question already, okay, how do these depend on P? Are these properties equivalent to each other? How does it depend on the underlying group? You'd be asking yourselves the right question at this point, if you've understood the material. Uh, so let's start with the, actually, I'll just quickly just write down what G Fourier type is in case you do know locally compact abelian groups. If not, G Fourier type. the G Fourier transform of a function F. So you have a function that's in LP of the group and you have to map into LP prime of the dual group, whatever that is. This G Fourier transform maps functions on G to functions on the dual group, whatever that is. This is just if you know what I mean by that and if you don't ignore it. So there's a Plancherel theorem, which you probably know. If X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space, then X has G Fourier type two for every G. In particular, for the real line, for the torus and for the integers. So if your Barnack space is a Hilbert space, or if it's isomorphic to a Hilbert space, you have the best Fourier type possible. Okay, I haven't said that Fourier type two is the best possible, but it is. And every Barnack space has Fourier type one. This is not Poncherel. Every X has G Fourier type one for all G. So Fourier type one is trivial and Fourier type two is the strongest and it comes from being a Hilbert space or isomorphic to a Hilbert space. So I've, been, I've said a couple of times Fourier type two is the strongest. I want to justify what I mean by the strongest here without proof. By an interpolation argument, if you know about complex interpolation, which you probably don't. If X has G Fourier type P for some P and some G, 
think of G as realign torus integers. Then X has G Fourier type Q for all Q between one and P. So when I say that Fourier type two is the strongest, I mean that it implies Fourier type P for all P less than two as well. So Fourier type one is the weakest, Fourier type two is the strongest in between, it gets stronger as you go between one and two. By an interpolation argument that I won't give you. And this is for a fixed group G. So G Fourier type P implies G Fourier type Q for Q less than P for the same group. And it, it does turn out this Fourier type property does depend on the group, but there are a lot of equivalences between groups. So let me just quickly give examples without proof, although some of them we've seen already. An example is X is an LP space on some measure space. This will have G Fourier type uh, minimum of P and P prime because the Fourier type has to be less than or equal to two. P is greater than two, you can't say you've got Fourier type P, it never happens uh, for all groups G. Uh, we showed this for the real line at some point back in week three or something, I can't remember. We have shown this, we did Fourier type very briefly. And we showed, I think either it's an exercise or we explicitly showed that it does not have R Fourier type greater than that exponent. Did we show that? I honestly can't remember. Maybe we didn't show it. If we didn't show it, it's in every textbook that's got Fourier type. I think we did show this actually. Yeah, we did this weird modulation argument. Yeah, whatever. This exponent here is optimal, at least for the real line. Another example that I won't prove, again, it's an interpolation argument and I didn't have time to teach you how interpolation works. If you take a Schatten class on a Hilbert space, one of these spaces from last week, this has the same Fourier type exponents as LPS for the real line at least. I say for the real line at least because I don't actually know whether the Fourier types are equivalent for all of the, yeah, all of the different groups. I just don't know. It might be known, I don't know personally. So this gives you a bit more of the idea that Schatten classes really just behave like LP spaces. They've got the same Fourier type, at least with respect to the real line. All right, so let's do some work. Let's prove a proposition. For the proposition, were there any questions about the definitions or the examples? It all sort of makes sense. Good. So let's take X to be a Barnack space. All Barnack spaces are complex from now on, unless I say otherwise. I don't want to write complex all the time. P is between one and two. Then X has real Fourier type P. If and only if the dual space X star has R Fourier type P. So this property of having, this is actually true for every group, but I'm only gonna formulate it for the real line. Actually in general, you have to go between G and the dual group G hat. So for example, torus integers X has torus Fourier type P, if and only if the dual has integer Fourier type P. Not P prime, just P. You're in the Fourier types only between one and two, so there's no duality of the exponents here. But the important result here is just for the real line. We don't have to think about these generalities. I'll give a very quick proof because the proof is just very quick. Take a simple function. G, which is L1. Why am I taking it on the dual group? Okay. L1 and LP on the dual group. That's no, sorry, on the dual Barnack space, on R valued in the dual Barnack space. I'm confusing myself now. We're going to test the 
the norm of the Fourier transform of G, yep, in LP prime, valued in X star by duality. I should have said from the beginning, assume X has R Fourier type P. And we're going to prove that X dual has R Fourier type P as well. And the same arguments is going to be completely symmetric. And by density, it suffices to consider simple functions. So we test the norm of the Fourier transform of G by duality. So let's take a simple function F in LP valued in X. And by the, all of the duality stuff that we already know, we know that it's to test the dual of an X star. Of, I'm not making any sense today. To test the norm of an X dual valued function, it suffices to test against X valued functions. You don't actually have to test against X double dual valued functions. X will do here. So we integrate F of Xi against the Fourier transform of G. And we look at the absolute value of that. This is a simple Fabini argument. You've, if you've done Fourier analysis, you've seen this argument before. You just write out what the Fourier transform of G is. G of T, DT, T, Xi, like that. You take the integral out of the pairing, you do a bit of Fabini, put everything back together. I'm just gonna do it in one step to save time. e to the minus two pi i t xi f of xi d xi integrated uh, paired against g of t dt. Just rearranging all the integrals, doing a bit of Fabini, standard stuff. This is the Fourier transform of f at t paired against g of t. Right, and now we just put the absolute value inside the integral, take some norms, use a bit of Holder inequality. We bound this by the LP prime norm of the Fourier transform of F times the LP norm of G. And G is X dual valued. And so now we've reduced it down to the properties of the Fourier transform on X, well, on X valued functions. And we assumed that X had Fourier type P. So we can use that assumption. So this is using the Fourier type P of X. We bound that by the LP norm of F times the LP norm of G. So if we look at where we started and where we ended up, that tells us that the norm of the Fourier transform of G in LP prime, because we tested against LP functions F is bounded by the norm of G in LP, which says that X star has real Fourier type P, which is one direction of what we wanted to show. We wanted to show that X having Fourier type P implies that X dual has Fourier type P with respect to the real line. And if you look at this argument, you see actually the exact same argument shows the same argument with tiny modifications shows that X having Fourier type P or X star having Fourier type P implies that X has Fourier type P. <laughs> so we don't need to do any more work for the other direction. It's the same argument. Or you note that, okay, if X has Fourier type P, then X dual has Fourier type P. And then that implies that X double dual has Fourier type P. And you use that X is a closed subspace of X double dual. And you use the closed subspaces of things with Fourier type P and Fourier type P. That's the, the lazy man's argument. And I should have done that from the beginning because I am a lazy man. Right. So real Fourier type P at least is perfectly stable under duality. Works for general groups too, when you know how the duality of groups works. And we're gonna use this at some point later on. It's a fairly simple proposition, but it, it's quite handy. Duality comes up all the time, you know that. Now, what our goal is for today is to show that real Fourier type, torus Fourier type, and integer Fourier type are all equivalent. To 
to each other. So I made, I think I said that on Thursday already, that's no surprise. All this fuss I made about the three different definitions of Fourier type, real, torus, integer, they're all the same thing. They're all equivalent to each other for a fixed P. You can't vary P, but for a fixed P, these properties are all the same. These groups are sufficiently closely related that you can go between their different Fourier types. You can't do that for every group. These groups are special. I think that's all we're really going to prove today. I think that's the whole point. Yeah, seems so. Okay. Oh, no. We're going to do a bit more than that. Good. That's not our only goal for today. Hopefully we have time. So let's start working towards this goal. We need to somehow relate Fourier transforms on one of these groups to the Fourier transforms on the other groups. And if you've done Fourier analysis, you'd know that, okay, yeah, the Fourier transform on the real line and the Fourier transform on the torus, they're pretty closely related. If you take a, a periodic function on the real line, you can make sense of that Fourier transform. It's the same, it's the torus Fourier transform of the induced function on the torus if you have a periodic function. You need to know distribution theory to do all of that. And we're going to avoid that. We're just going to work quite directly. Our main tool is a discretization lemma. This discretization lemma is going to let us go from the Fourier transform on the real line to the Fourier transform on the torus by somehow discretizing Fourier transforms. It'll make sense when you see the lemma. X is a Banach space, P is between one and two, and P is greater than one. This thing doesn't work for P equals one for some reason. Let's fix a scale lambda greater than zero. We're going to do some dilations of functions. This is going to be a scale parameter. We fix a capital N and we take a finite sequence in X. Parameterize X sub K where the absolute value of K is less than or equal to this capital N. We're going to be looking at trigonometric polynomials essentially of degree N. That's why this indexing comes in. And define a function f on the real line valued in x in terms of the sequence by, I'm going to write it out in two ways. One is the explicit representation f of t is lambda to the minus one on p, sum over all of these k's, take the characteristic function of the unit interval minus k, t on lambda times the vector x sub k. I probably shouldn't call this a discretization lemma. It's a continuous sization lemma. <laughs> we're starting with the sequence and we're building a continuous function out of it. It's actually the other direction, not discretization. Um, if you like formulas, this definition of F makes sense for you. If you prefer a bit more conceptual things, F is the sum over K of the dilation by Lambda normalized in LP of the translation by K of the characteristic function of the unit interval tensored with the vector xk. I find that's a better way to think of this function than the, the formula that's written out because you see what's really happening. We've taken the sequence of vectors xk and we've attached them all to a function in a certain way. Then the point of this lemma is that the real Fourier transform of this function f it's LP prime norm. So we started with a P between one and two and we're looking at P prime norms. It's equivalent with a constant depending on P with this norm here. Okay, let's make it to capital N, sorry. Complex exponential E sub K, tensor with the vector X sub K. Okay, and this is LP prime torus, right? And I guess you should think of this as the Fourier transform of a function on the integers. So this is gonna be pretty strongly related to proving Z Fourier type, assuming real Fourier type. That's what this is all about, essentially. And you'll see that in a bit more detail later on. 
everyone comfortable with that statement? I think you'll get more comfortable when you see the proof. It's pretty much explicit computation with a couple of estimates, actually one important estimate and explicit computation. The first thing you have to do is actually write out what this Fourier transform is using the definition of F. You can do that pretty explicitly. By linearity, you just put the Fourier transform inside the sum. It's Fourier transform of a dilation composed with a translation of a characteristic function. And you can put the vectors on the outside of that because that's how the Fourier transform works. It's actually the Fourier transform of the scalar valued functions tensored with these vectors. There's no real vector valued content here. Then we use known properties of the Fourier transform. Maybe you don't know them. Oh, we've used them a couple of times already. So you should know these properties by now, I guess. Fourier transform of a dilation is a dilation, but the scale gets inverted and the P gets converted to P prime. Fourier transform of a translation is a modulation by the same parameter, or it's negative, I always forget, it doesn't matter, times the Fourier transform of the function, we just write that, the hat, and all of that's tensored with the vector xk. Everyone's okay with this? Fourier transform commutes properly with these translation and dilation operators, but it doesn't commute as such, it intertwines them with other operators. So we need to, how am I going to write this out? And because the, yeah, the dilation function is linear, so we can take that out of the sum. And the modulation just multiplies this function by another function, by a complex exponential. So let's write this in this way. This times, because this doesn't depend on k, times the sum over k of so this modulation just multiplies by a complex exponential, e sub k, and we have our x sub k in here. So we can write it out like that. So all of the k action is isolated in here. You've got some auxiliary function, Fourier transform a characteristic function of an interval that we're going to have to deal with, and this dilation out the front, which you know is not going to affect LP prime norms because it's an LP prime normalized dilation. So let's estimate what we need to estimate, the LP prime norm. Let's take it to the pth power. We know that that dilation is not going to affect it at all, so we could ignore that. We just have the norm of this Fourier transform multiplied by this vector valued function here in LP prime to the P prime, dilations vanished, that was convenient. And we're gonna write this as a sum over integers. So instead of writing this as an integral over R, we're gonna write it as integrals over intervals of unit length. Integrate from M to M plus one for each M. We have a bit of a Fourier transform here to the P prime times the norm of this vector valued function, e sub k of xi times x sub k, that's in x to the p prime. Everyone following? Cool. And basically this is the norm we want to control things by. We want to control things by the LP norm of that on the, on the torus, yeah, on the torus. Now this is a periodic function, Z periodic. So if you shift Xi by one or by M, it doesn't affect the result because these complex exponentials are periodic. So actually this thing on the inside of the integral doesn't really depend on M at all. Well, it doesn't really depend on where Xi is. So you can change variables and write this actually as the integral from zero to one, sum over M of this Fourier transform and Xi plus M to the P prime times this norm E sub K of Xi, X sub K. And this thing does not depend on M. 
Does that make sense to everybody? It's just a clever change of variables using the periodicity. So at this point, we just need to show that this sum involving this Fourier transform to the peak power, we just need to show that this is equivalent to one with a constant from above and below. Because then we can just replace this with one up to a constant from above and below. And what's left is just the LP prime norm of this function. And that's what we want on the right hand side. So we're just reduced to this control here. And really that's where all the content of this theorem actually is. And it's just a scalar valued Fourier analytic estimate. You can show this, you can compute this sort of exactly and say what the best upper and lower bound is, but we're gonna do it crudely because as I said, I'm a lazy man. Start with the upper bound. This is actually an interesting exercise in Fourier analysis. How would you efficiently, or at least how would you quickly estimate the upper and lower estimates of this? I don't know the best way to do the lower bound, but I do know the best way to do the upper bound. So this upper bound, we say, all right, this sum over M of this stuff, P prime is greater than two because P is less than or equal to two. Okay, P prime is greater than or equal to two. So this sum is less than or equal to, I should have the one on P power to make this true. This little LP prime norm is less than the little L2 norm because P prime is greater than two. So I can replace that P prime with the two as long as I have the one on P prime in the bracket, outside the bracket. So when we're proving this upper bound, it suffices to take P prime to be two. Now by Plancherel, you can see every little L2 sum is actually the big L2 norm of some function with the Fourier coefficients given by this. So we write this out as, actually I won't do the Plancherel yet, I'll just quickly reduce it to something a bit more reasonable. We write this as the modulation by minus psi of this characteristic function because there's a translation in there. Translations become modulations at M. And this by Plancherel is the L2 norm of the function modulation by minus Xi characteristic function of zero one on the torus. That's the clever step. Take a good look at that step. All right. You know that modulations, they're just multiplications by functions of modulus one point wise, so they don't affect the norm. And the L2 norm of this function is one. There's your upper bound. I like that proof because you don't really do anything explicitly. And you certainly don't compute what that Fourier transform is. It involves sync. No one likes to deal with sync functions. Sine x on x, stupid function. Let's do the lower bound. We need to be a little bit more explicit with the lower bound, unfortunately. We're looking at the infimum over Xi and R of this sum. M plus Xi to the P prime. We want to show that this is greater than zero, basically. We want to show that this doesn't go too small. If this goes all the way down to zero, then we don't have an upper and lower control by a reasonable constant and our estimate will break down. How do we estimate this infimum? The first step is just to use periodicity. This is a one periodic function. So with this infimum, we can restrict it to Xi between minus a half and a half. So it's periodicity. 
why is it periodic? It's because we summed over all m and added all of the translates. So if we were to translate it by one, we'd just be shifting the index m. This function is, is forced to be periodic. Then you can say, all right, well, this, this is a sum of positive terms. It's bounded from below by any one of the terms. So let's take the m equals zero term. Bounded by the infimum, greater than or equal to this infimum. We forget the sum, we take m to be zero. That's going to be good enough for us, thankfully. Incidentally, if you do this step before doing the periodicity reduction, it doesn't work. You need to first reduce down to one small set of xi and then take the zero term, which is a bit strange. Now, unfortunately, we have to compute it. I think we've actually computed this Fourier transform or something very close to it when we're looking at half functions. So I'm not going to give you the proof again. It's just e to the minus 2 pi i xi minus 1, 1, 2 pi i xi. We have a peak power. You just write out the integral explicitly and you solve it, you get this. Fourier transforms of characteristic functions of intervals are pretty easy to deal with. So in the absolute value, this xi doesn't, this i does not do anything. So it's just the infimum xi between minus a half and a half of e to the minus two pi i xi minus one to the p prime on two pi absolute value of xi also to the p prime. Let's just put the p prime out the front like this. The p prime doesn't really matter. You can even do this. And you just need to make sure that this quantity here doesn't go down to zero. The niche shot doesn't get too small. The orange, oh, wrong color. And if you look at this closely, you look at the numerator, you look at the denominator, for what psi can this thing possibly go to zero? The numerator is only gonna be zero at psi equals zero, because then you get a one minus one. And the denominator is actually never going to be zero, but you're going to possibly get problems at psi equals zero because you actually get a zero over zero when you take psi equals zero here. Let's just be a bit unrigorous. Only issue is at psi equals zero. And then how do you evaluate that? What the value is there? You use L'Hopital because you have zero over zero. L'Hopital's rule. The limit as xi goes to zero of this thing. Is the limit as xi goes to zero of the derivative of the top on the derivative of the bottom? What's the derivative of the top? Minus two pi i e minus two pi i xi. The one vanishes. The derivative of the bottom is two pi i. These things cancel out and you've got xi equals zero. And this is minus one. If I've done that right, it's certainly not zero. That's the important thing. So a continuity argument, which I haven't really done properly, but which you can see the point of, says that this infimum is greater than or equal to some constant depending on P prime, which is greater than zero. I have not really given the details properly of that, but I hope that made some sense. I like this non-explicit way of finding lower bounds. Just find where the worst case is, show that it's not zero. Okay. Anyway, what all of this tells you in the end when you do the argument properly. It's the last week. I don't have to do arguments properly. It doesn't matter. This thing that we needed to show is equivalent to one, is equivalent to one. And the proof is done. I think you can show that this this lower bound is something like one on two pi or something like that to the P. I don't know. You can do it very explicitly by actually computing the sync functions and doing a bit of trigonometric stuff. But actually, I think finding the optimal lower bound is a bit hard. Anyway, that will do. So what did we prove? We got caught up in a technical little lemma here. We proved the discretization lemma. that says, okay, take a sequence of vectors 
build a trigonometric polynomial out of that, you can actually think of that in terms of the Fourier transform of a real function, a function on the real line, and get some comparability of LP norms, which is going to let us go from R Fourier type P to Z Fourier type P, which is part of this equivalence we need. So I think it's a good time for a break.